Well, some news today. Wow, the news is we have a lot of people jumping on the program. So I thought I would just uh, introduce everyone quickly. Ron Pell is waiting patiently at the door. We'll get him in here. Um, holy cow, Barry Berman, blast from the past, Mr. Radio himself. Holy cow. And, uh, and a very, very, um, he's known very well in the uh, deadhead world. Uh, they all look for him at, at Grateful Dead concerts now. He's uh, synonymous with uh, Jerry Garcia. Um, but he's we've got some. <laughs> oh, so let's just take a, a quick uh, run around the room right now with uh, who's with us so far. As I mentioned, Barry Berman is here. Tom, uh, we got Brian Thomas is here. Dave Overson, John Landry, Bob Craig is here. Ed Bruder, Joe Conley is here to talk about the news with us. Pete Salant. I mentioned Ron. Uh, we got Russ Otis is here. Tracy Carmen is here. Ed Bruder is here. Judge Harrigan's here. And I'm still going through my list. Who have I missed? With Brian Thomas. Yep. That was a yeah. set of right at okay. the top. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, Barry, let's, uh, before we even get into it, because of course, you know, with the Connecticut Radio News Network, <laughs> I mean, really, you had, you did your own. Uh, how many newscasts with uh, with the Connecticut Radio Network? For when did you first get in, into doing the news and sending it out to all those different radio stations? Back in 1973. If you want to hear the genesis story of it, yeah, that'd be great. So I was working at WNAB and WADS, and uh, I I called okay. Senator Ribicoff's office. And I was working in the news department, and I said I wanted to do an interview with um, with the senator. And he said, well, I can do WNAB, but I could not do WADS because if I did WADS, I would have to do the stations in Southington and Old Saybrook. And WNAB, at least, is a major market, so, so to speak, in Bridgeport. And so we can only do Hartford, New Haven, and Bridgeport. And I thought that that was entirely unfair because... Mm. People who are listening to local radio in their own local towns would not have the opportunity to um, talk to their or to, uh, you know, to hear the voices of their um, of their uh, elected representatives. So um, I. Uh, I was on a law school interview and I had this idea that while I was in law school, if I put together um, a show. Uh, and wheel it to these smaller radio stations that maybe I could make 50 bucks a week in um, uh, in in some advertising. And so I was at this law school interview. The guy didn't show up for the interview. I'm in Boston and I see the New England Mutual Life Insurance Company. And I walk into the Mutual Life Insurance Company with this idea in my head. And I said I wanted to um, go to the receptionist. And the receptionist said, um, uh, I said, I want to see the president of the company. And she said, well, you know, he's a very busy man. Why would you want to see him? I said, well, I want to, I, I want to talk to him. So anyway, she was starting to Josh with me. She sees I'm a young kid, so to speak. And she snickers me up to the 13th floor. And I walk into the 13th floor and nobody's doing anything. It's the quietest space in the, in the entire New England Mutual Life Insurance. So... The, reception, the receptionist on that floor said, well, why do you want to see him? I said, well, I have an idea for a radio show. And all of a sudden, this guy comes out, radio show? And he walks out, and he walks in to say, why don't you come into my office? And it turns out he used to work at WBZ when he was a kid. And so I said, well, I have this idea. I want to do a show for these small radio stations. And he says, I don't have much of a business in Connecticut, but I'll call John Filer, Filer, Filer who was the um, chairman of the board of Aetna, and uh, let me let me call him up and I'll get you a, a meeting. So I got a meeting at Aetna. And um, and when I I had the idea that I wanted about twenty five, thirty dollars a week and the the director of advertising at Aetna, Doug Alspa, said, well, let me see what you can do. So we did an introductory introductory show. I got a whole bunch of radio stations to carry it with um, Tom Meskel, who was the governor. Mm -hmm. And Meskel said on our show that he's going to deny pay raises for state employees. And that ended up to be big news on the front page of the Hartford Current everywhere. And I, I, I created a name called Connecticut Public Information Network. So it would sound kind of public-y. This is before public radio. And um, so it was CPIN back in the day. And um, 
So all of a sudden, I'm on all the newspapers, and I walk into the office, to Etna's office, and the guy said, well, um, I'm, I see you can do what you said you can do, and uh, so we're prepared to offer you. Now, I really wanted 25 to 50 bucks, because I'm going to go to this. And um, so he says, we're prepared to offer you $800 a week for this show. <laughs> so... <laughs> Sure, better. This is 1973. So now yeah. I'm daydreaming. I'm daydreaming of taking my my girlfriend, who's now my wife, Peggy, to Paris for the weekend. What am I going to do for $800 a week? And so while I'm daydreaming, he says, I can tell you're not bowled over by my offer. He says, I'm, I'm willing to go $1,000 a week, but not a penny more. So I go, <laughs> wow. So I go, I'll take it. I'll take it. So then I, I started recruiting radio stations and and I sent a note out for all the stations. And I really only wanted the small markets. Uh, but when I sent the, the blast out, it went to New Haven and Hartford. And it, I ended up at CCC when um, uh, uh, when Howard Howard Stern was there. He was the public affairs guy. So I was delivering tapes to Howard Stern <laughs> every, every week. And um, so that's that's basically how that first show started. And then we started looking around for things that we could do that would help radio stations around the around the state. Um, and um, so we created a news bureau with Steve Kochko at the state capitol uh, because nobody could uh, afford to send reporters up to the state capitol. So we ended up having a news service and then we I couldn't hear the Yukon games. Um, in New Haven. So he made a pitch to um, the school to uh, say, hey, you know what? You have TIC, except that TIC uh, is now doing the whalers. Now you really need a, you know, you're really getting to be a point where um, where things are are, are going to happen for UConn basketball. And I think the whole state needs to, to have a network. So we created the network. And that's the four minute version. That's the radio version of the start of Connecticut Radio Network. Holy Toledo. And how many um, when when you were uh, at your peak, how many different um, feeds were you putting out or how many, you know, how many times a day or what time a day or, you know, when you first started there? Well, in Connecticut, you know, it, it ultimately became CRN International. And we were all over as, as Steve did such yeah. a good job for us and Ron Pell and so many of you. Ron Pell's here, by the way. Hi, Ron. Oh, yeah. Barry. Yeah, let me introduce you, Ron. <laughs> yeah. And um so in the beginning, um, we were Connecticut Radio. We changed the name from CPIN to Connecticut Radio Network. Joe Connolly uh, was helping us on uh, some of the state capital and uh, on some of the, um, the on some of the feeds on the national ski reports. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. the ski reports. Yeah, so much stuff. Anyway, um, so we had uh, for about five or six years, we were just doing uh, Connecticut Radio Network. Uh, we had three feeds a day. Uh, but when there was an emergency going, we could have up to 10 feeds a day. We started doing uh, election night with Steve Kochko. Um, we expanded the bureau in Hartford to three, three, uh, uh, three news people. Um, and uh, we did that for, I guess, 40 years. We, we kept the Connecticut Radio Network on. Yeah. And um, somewhere in the 70s, we had an opportunity to go national with a ski watch. And that went um, first regional, then national, and then um, a similar situation happened when uh, Maxwell House said to us, well, we see what you're doing in Connecticut. Uh, could you take this the ski watch all over the show, uh, all over the country? And I said, yeah, but that would cost a lot of money, you know? It would cost a million dollars. And he said, well, he says, we're a big company. We could afford a million dollars. So the next <laughs> thing, he gave us a million dollars. <laughs> They broadcast the ski reports for, for Maxwell House. It was the Maxwell House Ski Watch all over the country. And things happen like that. I don't want to take up all your time. So. No, 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 no. no. Is, it, it, that, that, it, it is fascinating. And the reason I, I, I really thought it'd be neat to start with you is because so many of the guys in the business, like when we were talking to, uh, we were talking to Brian Thomas before we got going, and he was talking about, you know, starting at BMI up on top of Meriden Mountain. Mm -hmm. And pretty much everybody got their start at a little station in the middle of nowhere that yeah. counted on, you know, someone like you to be able to provide all this stuff. Right. So I, th I thought it, uh, I thought it made a lot of sense. 
Yeah, we well, you know something very too. I think what would be great at some point in time is to, is maybe just have you and go through the whole history. And uh, I mean, man, oh man, you know, and how it changed, unfortunately, because the way you know the industry changed, which is just you know that kind of sucks. Um, so then uh, we also have uh, in the news world with us we have Joe Connolly here, who was yeah. uh, instrumental in uh, getting us uh, getting us started with. Um, with actually doing um it started with the reunion you know joe was such a part of that we started doing the 100th reunion of drc and then he had some great ideas and you know of course all the years of cbs and his world has changed we mentioned how you know paul mernane from cbs who anchors in the morning co-anchors he said to me there's four people in the news department and i mean you know gosh joe in his heyday how many god he can't even fathom cbs radio news in new york how many people were there i uh, Many, many, many people. It's been cut back a lot. But, you know, yesterday uh, you mentioned to me about stories that come to mind, big stories. And, and I'm sure Brian will have some, too. But the first one that came to my mind was Ella. Ella Grasso, the mm -hmm. election of the first woman governor in the country. And I rode, I had just arrived at DRC. I'd come down from Springfield and learned so much from Walt and Lon and Chuck. We didn't have characters like those three in Springfield. And I learned so much when I immediately came to DRC. And I covered the election of Ella Grasso, sat with her on her couch in Windsor Locks the night she was elected with the big D microphone talking to her as the returns were coming in. And uh, I rode uh, the election of Ella into WCBS because they didn't have anybody in Connecticut. She was making a lot of news. Barry may remember, uh, if you were there, uh, comes to mind the day that Gloria Steinem came to Hartford to meet uh, Ella Grasso. And there was a pack of people there. And Gloria Steinem... Uh, is a fascinating, just a, she turned 80. Our old friend Gail Collins recently did a story on uh, this is Gloria Steinem at 80. And that was some time ago. I think she recently turned 90. But she was an amazing woman. And she went to work for New York Magazine. And she admitted, she said, the reason that they took me on sales calls was because all the male executives wanted to meet Gloria Steinem. Uh, but I'll never forget that day uh, to see Gloria in action with Ella. Mm -hmm. But I have to tell, uh, I can't talk about this without telling one Lon story. <laughs> uh, because I learned so much from Lon. I also remember the day there was a big ceremony in the Hall of Flags in the state capitol to um, present awards to Connecticut women of uh, power. So like all of us do and do still do in the media, we had our microphones up. We took the opening remarks, but then the TV, the radio, we all had to leave before they went through all of the individual award ceremonies. So um, I crawled up in front of the governor to take my micro big D microphone down to get out of there. And the cord on the mic, caught one of the awards and just matched it to the floor, oh. of the, the marble floor of the Capitol. Oh, and I okay. said, so, sorry, Governor, I have to go. Well, anyway, the story spread all around. Lon turned it into a news story. And I could still hear it on the air because we had the tape. The tape was still rolling as the thing crashed. And Lon said something like, uh, uh, a distinguished crowd at the state capitol was aghast today when a, a clumsy reporter turned an august cer award ceremony into a shambles. And then he, he had the sound of the award wax passing on the floor. And he never said it was me. He never said it was a big <laughs> deep reporter. But that Lon was able to find stories <laughs> everywhere, just like that. And he and he he made those things sing. Well, I know you and you and Bryant both had a, a long history at uh, at DRC, and I mean, I didn't even know how far back Bryant went. But 
um, you know, uh, that that was just uh, the way you guys, because Apache and who wanted to be with us today, but he's traveling. Um, the, the way uh, Pat said to me a long time ago, you guys were on this, you know, serious, you know, top 40 or swinging 60 uh, uh, station back then. And you had to make it. They had to be hip enough for the kids to stay for a five minute news block. Oh, sure. You know, and if you did not, um, you know, they found someone else. And there was always this unwritten law that you had to tailor your newscast for what you thought the audience was going to respond to. And that's not unique to WDRC. That was, um, I remember Dave Slager down in New York saying that it everything here is pot pollution and politics. And as long as you do any stories from those three groups, you're golden. Our audience will respond. And he wasn't far off the mark. But um, the, the best thing I can remember about DRC was the night that Nixon resigned. I was alone in the newsroom. Walt was going to do the morning, so he didn't want to be there that night because he had to come in that early. And he turned me loose to do whatever I wanted to uh, in covering the Nixon resignation speech. And we had a deal with TIC at the time, because we did, had no network, to take the broadcast of Nixon's resignation off air and put it on our air simultaneously. And all we had to do was give him a call letter credit at the beginning and at the end. So I did that and taped the Nixon resignation speech while it was occurring, and everything fell into place. I finished the speech with Nixon. Then I went downstairs to the last National Bank restaurant, and I got reaction from people about the Nixon resignation because I had set it up with the manager of the restaurant before that. And I walked around table to table and got these wonderful reactions from people, including one from a seven or eight year old kid who said, yeah, it was time for this president to step down. And, you know, very you know, prophetic comments from a kid that was that young. Um, and then I went back upstairs and I had all kinds of reaction from Bill Cotter, who was the congressman at the time. And um, you name it, I had reaction to it. Um, and I set this all up for Dibble the next morning, and he was just bowled over by what I left him. Uh, and it was just four or five hours work. It wasn't a, you know, a Herculean task, but I had set up a lot of it beforehand just to make sure that I knew I could leave him something of value. And uh, it turns out it was one of the most productive nights of, of my career. Wow. wow. Brian, can Pretty I ask story. you, in those days, who had the final say on whether or not the news department could go long? Would it have been Charlie or would it have been Walt? Or did they work together? Well, they didn't like going beyond five minutes. Uh, Corson used to raise a stink about that. Uh, I used to, I went once seven minutes on a newscast Sunday at 12 o'clock, one Sunday at noon, and uh, I heard about that instantly. You know, you can't go seven minutes. you got to go five and a half max, and that was it. Um, and, um, I think that, you know, that, that's what they wanted, you know, and, and Orson always thought that, that the music was, was king and, and that we could not upstage that in any fashion with a newscast. But he also, I remember my dad always liked to add that sense of drama to, uh, to the newscast at DRC, you know, repeating the big D big story. Oh, and, yeah. And, and and Joe and I were talking about news views or news in the making the moment it's breaking and yeah. uh, so many things like that. Right, Joe? Yeah. And I, and I also remember, you know, the, as a as a reference, the women's movement was so-called women's movement was just starting to take off when, when Ella came in. So I wrote a story one day, uh, Governor Grasso says this or that. And then for the second reference, I said, well, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the, the use of he, he, she, Mrs., Mr. was starting to decline. So so in the second reference, I said, Grasso, Grasso also said, blah, blah, blah. It seems strange, but I said, well, I guess that's the way that things are going in society now. I just referred to her as Grasso. 
I got a memo from your dad. Two sentences. Joe, I heard you on the air today referring to the governor as simply as Grasso, period. This is Grosso, period, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, Charlie God. Humor. Yeah, I, I, no I, has, I, sorry. I always got a kick out of the fact, and, and Ron, uh, Ron Pell can attest to this, how you know, we had we had guys in that building that even in the sales department, like, well, Rob Branham had his had his roots in news. But I mean, yeah. everybody would hit the street with a with a recorder if we didn't have enough re reporters to, to hit it. Right. That's Mark? exactly right. When yeah. I started in radio at WINF, can everybody hear me, by the way? Can you hear me? Yeah, Down I worked the, there. Yeah. yeah. When, I, every, everybody worked there. Yeah. But when I started there, <laughs> come election night, I was doing it was a funny story. I was doing a, uh, we were located, we were doing election night from, I think, like a, one of the uh, Alliance Club Hall, or some big hall somewhere. And I was doing it with Scott Gray, whose real name, by the way, is Chris Albert, as most people know, in the business. So he's doing, he's walking across the room, and I needed him for a second, and I forgot. I said, hey, Chris, Chris, come back here. He comes running back, he says, don't you ever ever refer to me as Chris Albert. I, I go to great straight lanes to protect my identity. I'm Scott Gray. Okay, Scott. Okay. All right. I, I'm sorry. I'll never do that again. And I never did because he was, he was nuts. But yeah, we all did that. But let me say this. When I started at WINF, I started there. And the first thing I'm, I'm at the, at the station, they have a station on the background. And the first thing I hear is I'm Steve Kotzko reporting on the Connecticut radio network. I said, what the hell is that? And I certainly found out what that was, but but that was, and Barry alluded to that, that was the lifeline of news for all the small stations. Because you're right, we couldn't afford WINF. I mean, I think they were billing $20,000 a month. There was no money. And, you know, to, to have a resource like that for, what, three, four, five spots an hour, you know, to give up inventory, it was, that was godsend because that, that, you know, that resource existed. And you had a guy like Steve Kochko, who was, you know, as everybody knows, he was the pro's pro at the Capitol, constantly feeding you information. And it was just fantastic. Yeah, that was, was two, was, two uh, spots a day. Two, two spots, spots a day ran that whole, <laughs> ran the whole network. Yeah, but you were on how many stations back then, Barry? 30, 40 stations even yeah. then? Yeah. Yeah, fortunately, we were able to get the major markets too, like WAVZ in uh, New Haven. Charlie Steiner was the news director, and uh, WICC carried us in Bridgeport. So, uh, so it was pretty good in terms of um, having that coverage. And so we were able to get um, Connecticut Milk for Health as a client for two years. Uh, we got the, the Connecticut Lottery for two or three years. So. We were uh, but every station, but you, but every station, not just the small stations, yeah, because no. I remember, you know, uh, uh, would, would come to me as Zenobia would come to me and say, what do you need? How about a weather report? Do you need a new, another different news report? What about sports? I mean, whatever the, whatever a station needed and yeah. didn't want to go to the lens of creating the resource, the Connecticut radio network would supply it. And you remember, do you remember at WCBS, Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob, yeah. mm -hmm. remember that? And who wasn't a doctor, and then he got fired. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so and he tells the story. So I'll get into that for a second. But um, Dr. Bob, the day he got fired, I called him up because he was the best weatherman in New York. And I called him up and I said, "Okay, you're fired from that. Would you come and do Connecticut for us?" So that's we ended up with a weather service at with Dr. Bob. We didn't call him Dr. Bob. He was now Bob Harris. But uh, we were able to then start getting more inventory by offering weather reports. Yeah. That, you, you... Thing too, Barry, I mean, did you ever imagine when you started this that it would turn into, you know, um, with all these spots that you bartered, who was the one that finally, uh, well, it was probably you, Barry, but how did you finally go out and start looking at local businesses that get on there and, and get all over the state and, and, you know, build up a sales staff and all that and make it so profitable? Well, you know, it was stressful. And um, all I can remember is it, it wasn't that, you know, I'm, I'm telling you the good stories, you know, the, the, the nice stories about getting these clients and, and 
and getting big contracts, but it wasn't it wasn't really easy for the first several years. And my mother kept saying, Barry, you can always go to law school. You can so whenever I would whenever I would go home for dinner or visit my parents, Barry, and I would I'd be complaining, Oh my God, there's so much stress. There's this, there's that. Barry, you can always go to law school. You can always go to law school. <laughs> Barry, I'm just thinking I, it, it's not going to happen, I guess. It would almost be great if you restarted the Connecticut Radio Network again today because so many stations could use it. You know, right. would anybody no. want to buy? Their ratings are down so much. But as you talk about this service, and I remember all these days, uh, it's something that is almost needed today all over again. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. Well, right now there's no FCC requirement to carry news, I, I believe. Right. That's right. So that was the Telecommunications Act of 96. That's it. Goodbye. Right. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to do anything. So, you know, the more the more spoken word is on radio, the more um, more people don't want to listen. The problem, problem is, is that all the, all the, the programming these say. days is, is delivered uh, you know, it's all syndicated programming, so you exactly. got to deal with the syndicators. Yeah. And they usually, the I Heart Radio and Odyssey and these big companies will say, well, we don't need you. We can supply exactly. our own stuff. We don't need, we exactly. don't need to. Yep. Do yep. Yeah. But Joe has a good story that I remember, and I'm, I'm hoping he still remembers it, about uh, um, Weber. What's oh, uh, Representative uh, Weber. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Al Weber. Al Weber, who, whoever. Who my mother ended up beating in a in a, in a for the state rep in college. and so she. Right. Became, but <laughs> but uh, a, yeah, so tell this story. This is a great story. He, I also did an election commercial for uh, Barry's mom when she ran for the legislature, and the story. The I remember the line was, you know, Roz Berman works for you when they wanted to close the fire station uh, in Westville. Uh, she fought and kept the station, and she'll fight for you and keep everything for Westville. And she won. Great she won two or three terms, right, your mom? Yeah. Right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the right. Al Weather. It was a. There was a day to, for some reason at the state capitol to honor clowns. <laughs> it was Clown Day, Connecticut Clown Day, or something. <laughs> and Al Weber, as I recall, was kind of a showboating. Uh, state rep, kind of like Doc Gunther, who we used to hear. We always yeah. read quotes from yeah. him. Remember Brian, Doc Gunther? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm over there with my microphone. He wore a bow tie, though, always. Huh? What? I don't know whether I'm spoiling, but he yeah. always wore a bow tie. Well, he always wore oh, a bow yeah. tie. Right. And yeah. and a bright, colorful bow tie. I don't know if it had laughing faces or something. So <laughs> I'm interviewing him about Clown Day, because he was one of the sponsors. And eventually, because of my questions, he starts to realize that I think he's a clown. I don't know. He's <laughs> a rep Weber. I, I think he said something like, is it uh, I mean, he's not a clown? <laughs> it's, look, you thought he was coming out. It was clown day. He was coming out of the governor's office. Right. You thought he was a clown. <laughs> he said he, so you went over to him. <laughs> and and he's and and Joe said to him, he said, uh, and so sir, and, and the guy's going on, he said, Well, I want to talk to you about clown day. And he said, Oh, well, clowns are so important. They do this, you know, they cheer people up, they're very important. And then Joe says to him, what is it exactly that you do that makes people laugh? <laughs> <laughs> I can goes, still see the look on his face of astonishment and shock and insult, right, you know. Right. He goes, well, Look, you're wearing a I, I, bright yellow bow tie and a blue shirt. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I am not a clown. These people are clowns. I am not a clown. <laughs> oh, my God. There were a lot of clowns there. That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, um, I just want to jump in here for a minute because we've had some other guys uh, join in while we've been here. Uh, uh, Dave Nagel has come in and joined us. Bob Marks. Clark Smith's here. Lee Gordon, wow. Terry Woods, and we're uh, we're just going around and talking a little bit about uh, about news. Um, I just wanted to to jump in here and kind of open it up for everybody else because you you've all worked with different form of news, and I'm sure in some cases you had to probably do your own news. And um, I, Lee, you were you were at were you at POP when it went from rock to news? I mean, 
I mean, how did you how did all that transition take place? Well, uh, I was one of the last group of uh, top 40 guys uh, 50 years ago. And so I was I was only there until it went all news and then came back a year and a half later. So I was there when it was all news, but <clears throat> but not for not at the beginning. I used to listen all the time, but um, but uh, yeah, the, uh, my last my last day of work was the day before they changed to all news, and then uh, I came back later for the for. But maybe for maybe uh, you years. and Judge can talk about what the news department was like at POP back then, because we know DRC had a pretty pretty polished up uh, crew, and the, the, a lot of them yeah. went on from there. Well, yeah, but even when we were top forty, we had a five. We had a five or six person news staff. Charlie Charlie Steiner was the was the news director, and uh, we had uh, Mike Burke, and Susan Riggs, and Jim Marco, and Dave DeRosier, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, so we had you know we and and Lloyd Wimbish. So we had we mm -hmm. had five or six guys that you know that that were that were doing the news, and then um, I think Mike. Mike Mike Burke and Susan Riggs were already gone by the time they did switched over to 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 news, but they brought in uh, Bob Michaels and they brought in uh, Dominic Avery and um, Bill Watson, and it, so they they had six to start with, and then they added like four more. So we had we had a, a, a substantial news staff when it was when it started out as uh, as all news, yeah. And the thing was in. When I worked there in 79, that was during the hostage crisis, and POP's great rating splash occurred during those months. And I think it went up to like an 8.2 or something like that. And POP never had numbers like that when they were all music. Um, and it was just such an amazing accomplishment. In fact, we had people uh lawyers who who called us to do interviews saying you know i used to listen to toc all the time but now i realize that you've got all these good people working here and you're you're getting interviews on the air faster than tic does so i would i'll listen here instead now that didn't last but it was a great flash in the pan while it occurred but it proves one thing if you talk to people if you relate to them with stories that matter to them, you'll always get a response. And we're not doing that anymore. Can, can I tell a quick story about uh, about POP before this, the changeover? We used to, we had what we call, it was called hotline news. We had a special telephone number. Yeah. And if you called the number uh, and you got the, and you, and you called in the best tip of the, uh, of the month or whatever it was, you, you got, uh, some uh, cash, a hundred dollars, or five hundred, or whatever it was, and um, the night of the killing at Donna Lee Bakery, yeah, somebody called oh, it in wow. to the sure. station, and we, of course, being in Newington, we were only about a mile from the from the scene, and so uh, somebody from the station went went right over, yeah. and um, and got to, got the story and as a result because we had we had the details first when one of the killers was on trial um Charlie Steiner was subpoenaed as a witness to uh to play whatever it was that what uh, you know some whatever it was that that we had on the air that night and he he walks into the to the court he's in the courtroom with his cassette recorder that has WPOP on it. And the defendant says, oh, I listen to that station all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a, a corollary to that story. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 A corollary that it's a Lon Landis story. So when I think the guy's name was Leon Pikorsky, I don't remember his first name, the, yes. the, uh, the murderer, right? Leon Pekorsky. So here's here's how Lon ended the uh, newscast that day. <clears throat> I'm repeating the top story, the big big D story of the hour. Ninety nine years to life. This is your life, Leon Pekorsky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember that now. Yeah. Hey, um, I I know that uh, Bob Marks is going to have to jump out soon because I know he does some training at ten thirty. Um, not today. Oh, you're not doing it today. Oh great! I'm coming yeah, I, off. Yeah. I'm coming off of a bad 
bout with COVID, man. I, oh, I, oh, I can't man. get back to the gym right now. It's been uh, almost two weeks. Wow. 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 You know, speaking, speaking of COVID, I mean, what about you guys? How did how, the guys active in the, in the, uh, whether it was in the news business or radio, how did you guys all deal with COVID? What happened in, in New York city, Joe? Well, it shut down, but we, uh, immediately came out with sponsored stories and I did ads for business groups on the recovery of New York. I, I mean, you know, it was terrible, but immediately there was a market for uh, stories about how businesses are recovering, how they're changing, uh, the remote work uh, story. And, uh, but a lot of the audience apparently never came back, you know, and they didn't commute for a couple of years. I think that was the beginning of this very difficult phase in radio, COVID. COVID accelerated some trends, and a lot of listeners just found other ways. I remember I was, uh, we're at a swimming pool, and there was an old guy there, and he said, uh, uh, I say, you still on WCBS? And I said, yeah, we're well, still on WCBS. It was a couple of years ago. And I said, and he said, oh, he said, I don't listen anymore since COVID. He said, I get all my news off this laptop. <laughs> wow. Yeah. wow. You, know, you know, we talked about the ratings uh, a week or two ago, and and it's stunning how the cumul the cum audience of all the stations has dropped precipitously, like in half. Remember you guys who were on that call? You know, we went from like, you know, I remember the days when DRC, you know, the weekly queue was 350, 400,000. You know, mm -hmm. now it was what, 70,000, 90,000, something like that. I mean, for sure. And I think you're right, Joe. I think COVID had a lot to do with that. People just still not commuting. A lot of people still working from home, not commuting. That's And that's, you know, dr drive time audience is, is less than what it was. And uh, people finding other ways to, uh, you know, to get their news. It's you know, it's also true. a little bit disturbing is the fact that people actually tell you that rather proudly. They have kind of a smirk on their face. and They'll say, well, we just don't listen anymore to radio. Yeah. You get to tell you how many times I've heard that in, in, in recent years. Radio killed itself. It really did. Yeah. I have two grandchildren who are twins and another grandchild who's two years their senior. Not one of them has ever listened to an AM broadcast. Oh uh, only a couple yeah. listen to FM, and only in the car. Yeah, Angela's daughter is 30. She lives in Manhattan. She's a very successful businesswoman. But if I were to ask her if she's ever listened to the radio, probably only if Angela's driving the car. You know, to, you know just, just how she is. And, you know, because she knows how it, she's a sharp enough girl um, uh, where she... Um, she can kind of tell where the real stuff is coming from. And of course, when there's anything happening, and I don't know how it all works right now, but when there's a speech going on on television, they can always like shoot messages back and forth. Uh, you know, what is fake news? What is real news? So mm -hmm. it's almost like your audience is getting to uh, comment during some of these, uh, during television and, and radio. I mean, but primarily during television, they all have a group that they can bounce around to. And, uh, I don't I don't really know. I mean, it's it's kind of a kind of a scary thing. Clark, um, you've had so many incarnations of Clark Smith and you're still you're still kicking. And you never know what radio station you're going to be at next. But I would imagine you've had your taste of uh, news through the years. Yeah, I, I did my first rip and read uh, at WBIS <laughs> in Bristol uh, summer of 66. And I disintegrated a hospital. <laughs> Um, no, I, I had to the pleasure of working with WEEI and WBZ, and BZ had some tremendous, uh, you know, news people in the early 70s. And um, now John Harper, the news doctor from Stanford, supplies news and information for my uh, little 1220 WATX, uh, which I'm still trying to grow and connect to other um, smaller stations, because I think that uh, a network makes a lot of sense. And the, the, the people that are right here on the, these screens uh, could all supply 60 seconds a week, get them sponsored, we'll split it. And uh, it would be the personality that's very necessary 
to keep radio going. Um, you know, I, I understand the limitations of AM radio, you know, starting at a 500 watt day timer. But the point is that AM content can go on digital and feed FM and networks everywhere. And uh, that's the source of it. It's always been content and information and spoken word. And of course, our personality to add with whatever works. How about uh, Pete Salant? Um, you've worked in in uh, all kinds of different uh, formats, and it, you've been through the the changes at all these stations here in Hartford. You've gone to New York. How has how has news changed in the time that you've been in the radio business? Um, news has essentially disappeared from the landscape of radio because people are now choosing what they want to hear. Um, if they want to hear news, they'll go to an all news source. So from for from a music radio standpoint, we uh, are not we're, you know we're not doing news really. Um, it's not like back in the old days. We shared at, at AVZ in New Haven. We shared uh, news people. Um, I forget whether they came first or 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 afterwards with POP. Uh, Dominique Avery worked with us and Jerry Brooks. He was he was the best man at my wed my first wedding. Um, he was my news guy uh, when I was doing nights. And believe it or not, we had news at night. It never happened. Now we when I went to New York at uh, WYNY, owned and operated by NBC. We had news because it was it was at the beginning of the 80s and and we hadn't gotten the message yet that people don't need news. So we had news in certain hours, um, morning drive, noon, four, five o'clock. Um, but they were like three minute newscasts and they were more than anything else opportunities for sales. Um, I was always Spot looking, carriers. Sure. Always looking yeah. for an, a. a, a, a a way to um, you know to make friends with the news department and I mean with the with the sales department and um, th that really worked. In fact, one of the biggest uh, advertisers uh, was a car dealer in Paramus, New Jersey, and they stayed on that station and various stations for twenty or twenty five years. So um, I mean, we introduced them to radio and the power of radio. But it was all about sales. You, you know what's happening in in the on the news side <clears throat> in print, not even in print, but in online. Um, these organizations are now becoming nonprofits. So, because there's a need for news, and um, you know, it's possible that maybe it's some of these local AM small stations that need to feed the community. Maybe they can end up getting grants and. Um, other kinds of of financing, even from the local advertisers, but maybe it could become a nonprofit. One and of the things that was interesting about the Telecommunications Act of 96, when it first was proposed, there were four segments to it. And the first segment was the broadcast segment. And the second segment was the internet uh, propagation development platform that Clinton and Gore were just so excited about that they overlooked the rest of the bill. Mm. And the problem with the rest of the bill was this elimination of news as a requirement for public trustees. So anyway, yours truly decides, mm -hmm. let's see what I can do to get rid of this bill. So I called Ed Marcus, who was then the state chairman of the Democratic Party, and I explained to him that if this thing passes, the Democrats are going to have a real hard time to get their message out because of the homogenization of product that will occur once this bill takes hold. He had no friggin' idea what I was talking about. It went right over his head. So what does he do? He calls um, John Master, Johnny Master Petro, who is his counterpart at the same time, as the Republican chairman. He says, what is Bryant talking about? And the two of them had no clue. And of course, by then the bill was far along in the in the Congress, and it soon became law. Right. And the rest was history, you know. And it, it the deterioration was inevitable at that point. 
course, Brian, okay, another just... part of that bill, which was the component about allowing computers to operate stations as long as you met your technical parameters. In other words, you didn't have to have live staff in your building during the hours you were on the air. And right. that in tandem with the relaxation of program requirements really shot news, news in the foot for its future. Well, look at all the stations that have gone dark. I mean, uh, there's WFEA uh, in, in um, Man or Portsmouth, yeah. New Hampshire. 750 had a beautiful signal off the air forever. You can get that license for 10 bucks if you want it. Good luck. But that shows you where things are. Yeah, you're, that's WHEB AM you're talking about. Yeah, HEB, I'm sorry. Yeah. H -E -B. I have a question. I have a question for you, news guys, especially Joe Connolly because you've been kind of involved in this in a way. It seems like a lot of the AM stations, that, especially in major markets, that were all news for years, have taken to FM. They still simulcast the AM with the FM, but they promote FM as being the all-news station. Here in Philly with KYW, that's been all-news since 1965. A couple of years ago, they wound up being KYW uh, on the FM, they kept kept the AM, but they never promoted. Have you seen any results of that in the positive from WCBS, which also WCBS FM? You know, the same thing. They put wins on FM, yeah. and wins is up to a four point six, I think. Wins FM, mm -hmm. uh, not bad, and WCBS is down to a one point seven. The wow. point, the, the one point seven. Same as WOR seven ten right now. No, four point six in New York, Joe. It's a it's a very big. That's a very big rating. That's a I lot. Of, that's a lot of listeners. <laughs> that's uh, FM. That that's wins FM. Yeah, yeah. I guess and they it, it, combined the eight eighty and wins FM uh, wins news staffs so that all the reporters are heard now on both stations because that's taking the manpower away from WCBS, so they double up on uh they have them double team wins now and alex silverman who's now at knx i think was still was the first one to get odyssey's ear in philly uh, to do that they'd been talking about it for a long time and then they finally did it seems so like, the last it's like the last attempt to keep all news and all news station on the air and you know now um What's his name? George Soros, the billionaire, has yeah. bought a large stake in Odyssey. And the rumor and the speculation is that he may turn the Odyssey AM news stations into liberal talk stations. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's just a theory. Yeah, yeah. That's just God a forbid, theory. right? You know? I, I heard that story yesterday, and they, they were saying... Uh, he's after the second biggest chain in the country, so I'm thinking to myself, "Well, it's Odyssey or Cumulus." Uh, and then, and then the newscaster uh, said, "Well, they've got over 200 stations." And I said, "Well, it's neither of those then, because Odyssey has a lot more than 200 stations, don't they?" Right. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think. Um, I don't know. The last, the last I heard, I think, and it, you know, it changes. I thought. I don't know why the number 237 sticks out of my brain, but you know, <laughs> it was that you. Uh, but you know, it it really is something where I have I have repeatedly tried to get a different shift after all these years on on 1080, and um, and every time it's like I am I am their little area where they can kind of fulfill their community. Um, you know, public service, Steve. Yep. You're the public service guy. The yeah. show about nothing, and um, and also, <laughs> I'm, but I'm the one where you know I'll do the LGBTQ plus. I mean, I'll do whatever because they I'll get all that stuff on, and I joke about the fact. The stuff you don't hear during Monday through Friday, that's what I'll talk about, whether it's legalization of marijuana. A lot of the things I'm not necessarily for or against, but if you're not, if you don't let a voice for that be heard, but very clear. Steve, we hired you for what you do on Saturday morning. We're not doing it anywhere else. Steve. So yeah. Steve, when news breaks out, we break in here at Big D. I have news. I have news here today. Yes. You see this woman over here? Tomorrow, tomorrow, June 22nd, I'll bring you back to 1963. We will be celebrating our 61st wedding anniversary. 
Wow. wow. Congratulations. That's fantastic, <laughs> and, Chuck. And, and you know, and let me it, say, all credit for that goes to Diane. None of it goes to <laughs> Chuck, believe me. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you something about this guy who just uh, opened up his mouth. He owes me 20 bucks. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and in today's so day and age, by interest, I that would be $500. I think you guys ought to intimidate him to send me that $20. He's a cheapskate. <laughs> no, but then we'd, then, we'd, then we'd lose you having that, always having that to, to complain about. Why would we do that? <laughs> well, Russ, he, that's why Russ he, takes, he takes MasterCard and Visa, so. Oh, I want to oh, tell oh, you, Pete, oh, oh. believe me, oh, I'm oh, the oh, one who owes the count. money to from NHC. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I know there that, were two yeah. names. Uh, Lee Gordon, you brought up two names that a couple of guys here were familiar with. Charlie Steiner, Pete, he was our news director. Right, ABC That's right. when we were there, yeah. and Bob Michaels, Russ, when we were at NHC. Bob, Bob Michaels, Michaels was, was our... my newsman. He was the best. I loved him. Hmm. Yeah, he oh, was. Yeah, uh, he yeah. was good. He was good. You so guys know good. what Charlie Steiner went to, right? He's of the beast of the LA Dodgers gotcha. for thirty years. For thirty wow. years, and he was Vin. Yeah. He was Vin Scully's broadcast partner. Yeah, he was. Man, I love Vin Scully. I knew Such Charlie good. Steiner. I knew Charlie Steiner at ESPN, and I remember him doing his first sports center. He had the dark glasses, tweed jacket. He looked like a college professor on the stage. Yeah. I said, this guy isn't going to last. But he turned out to be a great, great on-air talent and a great guy personally. And Char a lot of fun. <laughs> and he was so easy to break up. That was uh, that was <laughs> one of his faults. But, but he was – remember him doing the – what uh, this is sports center promo oh. – and we were, we was at the Y two Y K whatever, and he had the hat uh, tie over his head, and everybody behind him is all, all panicking, and he's panicking. He looks right into the camera. He says, "Freedom, freedom! We gotta have freedom! You know? <laughs> Follow me to freedom!" Totally Char Charlie was the <clears throat> Charlie was the first Charlie was the first station to carry WABC. The first person I walked into, and he carried dial, and he just said, "I like the idea." And he was the first one to take a shot at us. I mean, a good shot. <laughs> That's good. I used to run into Charlie Steiner down here in Vero Beach when uh, we had the L.A. Dodgers spring training home. And uh, I used to uh, hang out by the by the booth, you know, when he'd come uh, into the booth or out of the booth and, uh, and, you know, tell him that I used to be a P.O.P. newsman back in 1970. And so we had something to talk about. You know, Bart, you mentioned the POP news staff. Um, certainly DRC had heavyweight voices with Walt Dibble and Chuck Krause and Lon and you guys. But POP did, too. They had Paul Lockwood, who came from New York. He was the news well, director. Paul was America. the guy who hired me. There you go. Joe Barbarette was there after he worked for Tom Dodd. Yeah. Um, Link Holmes later worked there. Yeah. DRC Joe had Lee Roberts and this. Hard. Joe Lee Barbarette Roberts had a big voice. Lee worked at DRC. He wasn't at POP. but he, yeah, he, No, he worked at DRC, voice. but he had a big voice, Ed. Yes, he did. Oh, yeah. Robert, Robert, Michael Michael Robert. Roberts. Robert Michael Walker, another one. Yep. W -W -D. Joe, was, Joe Barbarette was the one who announced the death of John F. Kennedy on WDRC. Yes. Mm -hmm. I heard the audio many times. And that's the latest on the shooting of the president in Dallas, Joe Barbarette. Bob Gray, BOP uh, featured Chuck Krause, who's still around in Pennsylvania, and uh, yeah, Randy yeah. Brock. Yeah, we had uh, Chuck at DRC, too. I mean, well, nice Chuck when he went to EEI. Yeah, Chuck was at EEI last. He used to have a a, a purple cougar uh, with the license plate Grok, G-R-O-K, uh, back in the Hartford days. What about uh, what about Aaron Shepard? Where did I, uh, is Aaron still with us or? No, he passed away a few years ago, but he, after he left Hartford and he was at DRC like about eight or nine years, he went to WROW in Albany and had a long run there. Yeah, I know that yeah. uh, between Aaron Shepard and Joe Barbarette, and I think I, I think I, I probably um, probably Ed, you'd know because I heard some of the audio uh, when they first started, you know, with St. Jude's with the teenagers' march against leukemia, and I remember they sent one of those two guys um, basically down to uh, to St. Jude's, I guess, down to Memphis while they were trying to get that hospital off the ground and and interview some people about you know children's uh, leukemia back then. 
Yeah, they, in those early days of DRC, it was a two-person staff, and then they had a, a, a utility guy who for many years was Walt Pinto, but as Kent Clark. And um, they had a variety of other guys in there. Uh, Mike Millard did it for a few years. Uh, Peter Crawford, who was the son of the general manager, Bill yeah. Crawford, did it for several yeah. summers. They had and a I variety of people. I think Joe Barbaret, and again, I, I always go back to you, Ed. I think Joe Barbaret may have been the one that um, – read the open letter to Kennedy when the assassination they happened. They did, yeah. They just released that, yeah. Yep. 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 Hey, Barry, you wanted to say something to Bob Craig. Bob Craig, yeah. Bob, I think you were the one who signed off on WPOP uh, when it was still a music station, and that was the switch. Um, and the reason I know that is because you worked with my wife, Peggy McCarthy, who was in the news department at WPOP on weekends at the time. And But I remember you signing off and having this... Little one, too. Well, that just uh, concludes our uh, our music for the last several centuries. I don't remember exactly what you said, but I remember you were the first, you were the last guy. Yeah, that was it. Uh, live, and then uh, the Wolfman came in. He had the syndicated show. The Wolfman was on at uh, and at then the uh, six o'clock. I think that was supposed to be me, but I was on vacation. Because, Probably, <laughs> which which is which is another thing because um, it it was close to the ratings period and i asked yeah. dick springfield you know i said i had this cross-country uh, trip planned with a couple of friends and i i said dick i'd like to i i need to take these two weeks for vacation and he didn't hesitate to say okay and i'm thinking well that was weird <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i i remember yeah. when when my when my grand when my grandfather when my when my grandfather died, it was during the ratings period, and, and he was kind of apoplectic that I had to take a few days off for the funeral. But uh, but uh, when I wanted two weeks of, two weeks off, no no problem. Bob Craig did that final Sunday music show on POP. It was a Sunday afternoon, I think, from two to six, and there was a terrific thunderstorm in the area because all the recordings of your final minutes are all lacerated with lightning sounds. Right, probably just as well. <laughs> hey, hey, Bob, it's just an act, an act of God right there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we, hey, we'd like to hear that, Bob. Why don't you play it for us sometime on the air, the, the last uh, few minutes yeah. of POP? Oh, God. That's, uh, I, I just kind of like, um, you know, emotionally, I, I, it really hit me, you know, and, and I was only at the station for about six months. But the fact of in the back of my mind was the fact that I didn't know what the hell I was going to do after that. And, you know, having about nine years was about, not, not, about at that point, it was about five and a half years that I was in Hartford. And, um, you know, it was just something that with all the hype that was put on P.O.P. losing the music format, it just kind of got to you like at the last moment or so. And uh, it was uh, it was quite a, quite emotional. I remember Charlie Steiner coming over to me and, you know, patting me on the back and, you know, good job. and all. But we had a great time that afternoon because we dug out a lot of old jingles and hearing from the people and putting them on the air. It was really a lot of fun. It was kind of like the way you would hope radio would always be. Yeah. But, yeah. And then also with the audience, too, that you had. I mean, at any given moment, especially in Hartford, which was a great radio market at the time, Obviously, from an advertising point of view, because of the proximity between New York and Boston, a great test market. <clears> but <throat> there were so many great resources, great people. I mean, all these names that have been mentioned today, people in news alone. I mean, just great, great radio. Yeah. I mean, how could you, how could you not want to be in this biz, so to speak? I mean, it was not yeah. really a biz of my Dave, mind. Was, Dave was Overson really was. Uh... You had mentioned how, I mean, you know, the rock wars for all those years between P.O.P. and D.R.C. And you mentioned going into and talking to my dad after uh, P.O.P. went all news and he had an interesting uh, comment to that. Yes. Uh, I said to him, congratulations, you won the, the rock wars. And your father was kind of very disappointed. And he goes, yeah. And he goes, he says, now our contest uh, prizes will go from uh, $1,000 down to $13 dollars and 60 cents <laughs> right. yeah. and he yeah. was right he was absolutely yeah. right it just everything yeah. dropped down and the excitement was gone and it was it was that way for i think almost two years and then tic fm came on 
And then that they were our rivals. And then I think they, that point, what, what I remember, Dave, is that you said that that um, that uh, my dad said, yeah, but now what? Because he enjoyed the competition because they were always trying yeah. to one up each other. And it was like the Lennon McCartney thing. Well, you know, you can do that and I'll do this. There was you mean 91 yeah. Q wasn't the big killer. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. No. no, 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 it was not. <laughs> it was not never caught fire. Uh, never caught fire. <laughs> Why not judge, fire, were you but with the POP fire. at the end, Judge? Were you there at the very end when they changed to it to news? And did you do any kind of special show? I was in sales at the time, and uh, I was looking forward to the fact that it was all news. I thought it was a great move. Uh, TJ and I had gone in to lobby uh, Al Pellegrino to get uh, POP AM, all of the programming on the AM, moved over to uh, yep. 4 FM. We thought that would be a great combo. Uh, but uh, they didn't want to listen to us. But uh, as far as uh, going all news, I thought, you know what, that's a great idea. But it was impossible at first to sell. I was uh, I was making some good money in sales when it was a top 40 station. But when I moved to uh, all news, all of the clients that I had were all geared towards a uh, young adult format, uh, top 40 type thing. And I lost a lot of clients and I found it uh, almost impossible to sell at first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I when I went there, um, I would have never had anything to do with the place. Of course, when it was you know, when they were doing uh, rock and roll. But uh, you know, on my dad's suggestion, he said Al Pellegrino was a a great guy to work with. And um, when I went over, the sell of that was just wonderful because the rates were right there. And as long you didn't you know, as long as you stayed true on the rates, we had CBS World News Roundup at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and when we were really pure news, other than AJ Austin did a great job doing, uh, doing his midday show, <clears throat> being all news, um, never showed in the ratings, but boy, oh boy. I mean, as far as qualitative went, there wasn't a, there wasn't one guy or a woman that ran a company or, or a lawyer or a doctor that didn't count on that station, whether it was wall street journal reports or whatever. And it was a moneymaker. And, well, the concept uh, was just, uh, it was too new at the time. Back you, then, yeah. You would, you would call someone up and say, yeah. hey, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about WPOP, the all news station. And I'd look at you like you had uh, like you had horns. All news? What do you mean all news? What, what, what kind of concept is that? That's <laughs> all you do is all, you don't play any music? What, what, what's, 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 what's that all about? When my buddy it. Marlon Cook ran WTOP, a listener called one time, got through to him, and said, why would anybody listen to all news all day? And Holland said, well, they wouldn't. And the listener said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. yeah. You know, a, uh, a, a story on when my news director that I got at KHJ was uh, Lee Marshall. He used to be at CKLW. And what a voice on this guy. I had him for a long time there. And then uh, Kellogg's picked him up to be the voice of Tony the Tony Tiger. Tony the Tiger. Yeah. Oh, that's They're great. <laughs> and so I lost a good a good man there. And he became the uh, announcer for uh, we took Charlie, what Charlie Steiner does now is uh, on the L.A. Dodgers. So he was there. And uh, Tommy Lasorda said that uh, if God had a voice, if God came down and his voice, his voice would be Lee Marshall's voice. Yeah. Uh, he, he had he had a he had a great. And this is KHJ twenty twenty news. I'm Lee Marshall. I mean, this guy, the speakers would just rattle. I mean, uh, I had jokers telling me. You got to get that guy off. He's breaking my radio speakers. We're going to sue the station. Yeah, he was good. He 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 was a good man. I mean, there's a lot of air checks around of him at CKLW, and he's, uh, you know, when they used to do that dramatic stuff in Detroit, uh, a twenty pound trailer truck smashed through, and he is. He was grilled. He was squeezed through the grill of an eighteen wheeler. <laughs> uh, I mean, some of those stories were just amazing. Yeah, but yeah, one, of things, one of the things I that say hello hello to, uh, would do. I wanted to say hello to someone to Brian Thomas. I haven't seen him in a long time. Hey, Judge. Uh, Brian was the newsman in the morning when I was doing mornings at WPOP. Oh. We used to but meet one of the things I remember about, about Bob Craig and other ones is uh, the lunchtime. 
Oh which, yeah. Which oh, yeah. was stupendous. What you oh, did. Yeah. Every- I surprised you know in this day and age, I'm surprised the station the station would probably go out and sell it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm surprised. Yeah. I'm surprised well, I did actually. Never- yeah. I, I took your idea and sold it to Lewis Rich. See, there you go. There goes all my money right there. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did what did Peggy wind up doing after POP? Uh, well, she wrote, um, you know, she wrote for the New York Times. She wrote for Boston Globe. Um, she uh, uh, did a news service for the last nine years that uh, uh, was syndicated uh, for, um, it's called C-Hit, that was syndicated for... Um, Basically, her beat was Veterans Affairs, um, and uh, she wrote the story, the first story on burn pits that uh, got um, that that ended up in Congress, and uh, and now she's going to do some other writing. I mean, she's she had a good writing career for uh, for a long period of time. Ted Broder will best. remember this. I will. Ted Broder. She's Ted in the other room. room. <laughs> Sorry. Ed Broder will remember this story. Um, it it started this week. Um, Pam Smart, you might remember, who arranged mm-hmm. her husband's death in a Papa Gino's in Seabrook with her student boyfriend, is up for a parole hearing after serving 30 years for being convicted of killing her husband. When... He was convicted. Lon Landis goes on the air at DRC. I'll never forget this. Greatest line I've ever heard. Smart. Not so smart. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, hey, Brian, by the way, she just admitted this week that she was uh, responsible for the kids killing first her time. husband. Yeah, yeah first, first time. time. Yeah. Yeah. First time, yeah. It hasn't scored any points with the governor and executive council, though, because they're still, they say she'll get another parole hearing, but they're not favorable towards releasing her early. Yeah. That story, and, incidentally, made Channel 9 the um, a famous operation because New Hampshire is unique. It only had, at that point, one commercial television station, and it was yeah. really competing against the Boston stations. Channel 9 made the decision to do live coverage of Pamela Smart for day after day, week after week for a long hearing, and that really cemented their reputation as a modern TV station. Yeah. My late brother-in-law was a was an attorney in the area and he was he he was he was involved in a case that was being tried in the adjacent courtroom when all of that stuff was going on. Yeah. But anyway, uh Sununu has said that um just the fact that she did this video plea this week for leniency uh will not make any difference. The, that the executive council and the, and the the governor are going to review the case based on its merits and not on some flamboyant display of a video. So you can read into that what you like, but if I were Pam Smart, I wouldn't be holding my breath. Not so smart. <laughs> not so smart. <laughs> I thought of Lon with the heat wave now, and he uh, had... We had about eight or ten carts with annual and standby audio. D Day was always one, which I remembered our big D D Day cart on that day. But uh, Lon would always whip the audience up on heat waves, and he had a 1940s uh, music cut. We're having a heat wave, a tropical yes. heat wave, and he'd play it in the newscast. Yeah. And then he'd say, call the news views lines. We want to hear how hot it is. And people would call and talk about, you know, I feel sorry for the people on the roofs, working the roofers and everything. And and he would create every summer, once or twice, a running news story with listener comments about the heat wave. But you know something? I, I have to admit that just about every news person I've ever met there's always the there are great straight men and great straight women with some of the wildest, sickest sense of humor. I mean, Lon, Lon, nobody could break up Lon. I mean, there's always the story about didn't he take off his shoe like uh, Khrushchev or something and pound on the news desk yeah. while he was uh, doing his yeah. story? Yeah, I think I, I think I told you the story one time that I tried my darndest to break him up, which by the way it happening anymore on the air everybody is so serious yeah. but i remember one time 
I said, damn it, I'm going to get this guy. And as you know, Jimmy English, our music director at DRC, uh, he had quite a collection of um, of interesting things in the library. <laughs> he, he had he had a dildo, and I remember. <laughs> and I remember Lon doing a newscast. And I said, "Damn it! If this doesn't get him, I don't know what will." Oh, I walked in, opened the door in the middle of his newscast, and I handed him the dildo. Oh, Jesus! And just to break him up. So what does he do? He grabs it out of my hand. And he starts waving it around, <laughs> continuing to read the news, straight as an arrow, finishes the new cast as if nothing happened. Oh, hey, Oasis, tell them what happened to your newscast at WNHC. What happened? So this guy, I think I was doing a public service thing. And this guy comes in and he lights, it with the, the trash can is right next to the board. And it's got all the ripped up UPI uh, paper, the AP paper, whatever it is. And he lights it on fire. So now I got <laughs> now I got a trash can that's on fire right next to me when I'm trying to read the PSA or the news, whatever it was. He takes out a schlong. Oh, he's in the in the trash can to put it out. Oh, <laughs> he needed a fire hose. <laughs> Saved him a trip oh to the uh, bathroom. I was just going to tell a similar story at POP. A... We had the, the main news uh, board had it. Uh, there was a side uh, a console that had its own controls, and the and the guy at the at the, at the main board couldn't couldn't control couldn't turn it off or turn it on or off. And Bill Schweitzer was doing the news on POP, and Jerry Brooks did. I don't think he lit it on fire, but he took a metal trash can and opened opened his mic and uh, took a leak into the trash can. Needed <laughs> 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 well, a fire know, hose. I was working at, at WRCH, Dell Dixon. I don't know if you guys remember yes. that name. Dell was uh, working weekends, and I was on on a Saturday, and I, I'm in the studio at WRCH, and Dell is behind closed doors in the newsroom delivering his news and he always went in there with a cigarette and i saw smoke coming uh, out of the door and i i left the studio and i opened up and, and dell was stomping uh in, in the <laughs> trash can because he had started the the upi uh uh <laughs> paper on fire Jeez. and uh i ran down to the men's room and filled up something with water and we're throwing water on it but Oh, I'll man. never forget that day. I thought the station was going to go up in flames at WRCH and in uh, Parmington. You know, you had, you had so many great news guys on uh, on POP, and of course, Joanne Nesty and Jerry Brooks. You know, they're they're uh, they're one two punch. And Joanne, hopefully, will be on with us. She's uh, she uh, uh, was uh, in on this uh, conversation. I mean, uh, in on the invitation. Um, but you also had Rob Branham there, who you know turned into a, a great. Salesperson, as Ron could tell you, and Ron's best friend. Sure did. But, but I, will, I, I will tell you, you know, when he wasn't feeling that well, and we knew he was going into the hospital, we didn't know if he was going to be coming back uh, to read to the Connecticut Radio Information System, which is where he and I volunteered together, and we would co-anchor the uh, regional roundup or something. And the funny thing was, it was one of it was like moments before the end of the of the broadcast, and I walked across the studio uh, hallway. And I walked in to, to Rob's studio while he was reading like his last story. And I took off my tie, my shirt, my pants. I'm standing there in my shorts. He never even smiled. He looked at me and with all the conviction in the world, he goes, back to you, Steve. And I mean, <laughs> I'm laughing. I run into the studio laughing. He grabs all my clothes and throws it out in the broad daylight in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Steve. Up. Hey, Steve, the only time I've ever done news on radio was at DRC. Your your father, I did a double shift. Lee Roberts was sick or some, something. He couldn't go on. And there were two newscasts at night. So for one week, I did news at DRC. And it was uh, Joe Hager was the night jock there. High gear Hager. Anyway, anyway, at the end, of, you know how at the end of the thing you had to, uh, uh, there was, repeating the big, deep, big story, that big voice. And of course, you know, back then I didn't have a voice. And so 
you know, was so funny. And I have an air check of this, and I still have it. Repeating the big, 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 big star. This is Terry White repeating the big, big, big star. You know, it was, <laughs> it was, it was quite, but it's the only time I ever did news, but I did a double shift. I needed to fuck off. Your dad, <laughs> your dad put was... me on there for a week. I if you think back, was... if you think back, Dickie Robinson did his own news. Yeah. At night? At night. It'd be like a one minute summary each hour. Yeah. yeah. They were 11, 11 or 12 o'clock, whatever it was. Yeah. 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 Well, and, I know uh, what uh, Brian had been. I, what what I, I enjoyed about Brian was he said how many times he worked at POP, how many times he worked at HCN through the, through the 60s. I mean, back, you know, and then you worked up at uh, BMI on top of Meriden Mountain. All the HCN, different. No, HCN was on Meriden. BMI was down on Charles Street in WLAE yeah. is what you're thinking, yeah. Steve. And yeah. LAE was up there, the, the station yeah. that uh, Paul DeCivino bought, the engineer of WPAT in Patterson. And um, he bought it on a lark, thinking it would uh, produce money somewhere along the line. And he never went stereo, and that was half, half his problem right there. He just thought he could run an AM station on FM and get away with it. And it didn't work that way. I had my, got my first job on the air because of Bryant Thomas. I went up to WLAE and I met Bryant. And then the program director asked me, can you stay on? He says, we like your audition. Bryant needed the night off. So I filled in for Bryant first time on the air. And uh, thank you, Bryant, for, for a wonderful career. <laughs> Look at that. Look what I did to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Got that right. <laughs> Oh gosh. Oh. Dave, did you put the pictures to that PRC piece? I wasn't here last week, but I saw the replay. Uh the only the only the yeah, the only pictures I've added were the uh D Day pictures. There was video already on that cut and he tried uh -huh. to talk about uh uh D Day. I well I went online, got some vintage pictures and, and just stuck them on, on there over his narration about uh, D-Day and- Who did the original Pete? Did you do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. you did great, great job. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. yeah, great job. Channel 53, which was originally on West Peak. The studio was up there. It was WATR TV. And it was nothing to do with, with 440 Meadow Street in Waterbury. There was no connection mechanically there at all at that point. It was all done uh, on the hill. And they had a country western guy who did a show once a week on a Saturday night or whatever. And it called for him to ride a horse up the driveway at top of West Peak. And he would dismount from the horse and say, hi, welcome to the Country Western Review. And then they'd go to a break. And this is all done with one camera. They'd go to a break and they'd wheel the camera inside, change the light damping on it while the break was on. And this guy would then sit down and do the rest of the show inside the studio. No one ever figured it out, mm. but they did it all with one camera. And one horse. <laughs> and it worked. And it worked. Yeah. Art Marcus told me that story. He was the engineer at ATR at the time. And uh, I, there's a million of these stories that I've, you know, I can recall, not Steve, so readily, but when I think of them, I can I can still recall them. But um, hey, I think I before we uh, before we wrap it up here, because we've got uh, I got Dave giving me the wrap up sign. I just 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 briefly, um, if anybody wants to chime in, is there any hope as far as uh, I mean, just news in general? I don't even know. It seems like almost all of it is uh, is somewhat sold out. I don't know. I mean, the guys are giving their opinions now that are anchors or whatever. I mean, it's all just, you know, you know, where is it? Or, you know, is, are, is there any, is there any uh, credible news source or any of these online sources credible or, or where's it going? I, well, I think that what Pat Sheehan said in his yeah. email to everybody really nailed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's basically saying that newscasters were becoming advocates and yeah. political advocates and the, it's not uh excuse the pun uh fair and balanced and it uh you know it and some of the stuff there 
they're doing uh, reporting stuff without getting confirmation on things. Right. Or the actual. It's uh, unvetted. Track. That's right. Yeah. The unvetted, the, the unvetted stuff is dangerous. Yeah. Absolutely. They're, they're and, slanting. They're <laughs> slanting stuff to whatever their personal opinion is, no matter which side it is. And and so you've got two two different stories all the time. Yeah. Well, well, I can Fox, remember up in yeah. uh, Portland when I was at uh, uh, Star Broadcast, uh, KISN, WIFE. He also owned uh, Coil in Omaha, K O I L. Uh, Don Burden. He lost his license because he made the news guy slant the news that his, uh, I forget the names now, a senator up in Oregon. He got caught and uh, a newsman blew the whistle on him to the FCC. This this went on for years, the, the uh, litigation, and he lost all his stations because of that. Yeah. Well, Don, well look Don at the John, the John Rowland flap with TIC's license renewal. I mean, that went on for a year and a half. They delayed the license renewal because of the, the connection between Roland pimping for his congressional candidate right. when he was specifically told not to in his first uh, parole. And, and you know, I, I, I have to wonder what um, Suzanne McDonald was thinking as the general manager of TIC when all of this was going on, and it was indefensible. It was well known. It was not something that she didn't know about. And and still she did nothing. And the the end result was a, a what twenty month delay in the renewal of the license that normally would have been a snap decision at the FCC. Um, now you had this lawyer in Hartford who was stirring things up uh, about about challenging the license renewal, but even with that if she had been proactive in terms of taking Roland off the air and saying we made a mistake, a lot of this would have gone away a lot faster. And uh, she never she never took the effort. So, well, I I will say though that uh, when he went over uh, when when Roland was on the air, and certainly somebody who didn't go along with him politically, he was entertaining because he he had you know he was, he was entertaining as a governor too. The guy had. He had he had the personality, he had charisma, but he also was very he, he also was a guy that you give him enough rope and hang himself. Some of the stuff he used to say on the radio, you're going, where the hell did that come from? But it also did. It, it did get some reactions. And I think, uh, you know, but when he <laughs> he came when he was on and he just basically, I, you know, he was, I guess he was getting messages on his final moments on the air. I don't know where he was getting messages from that. This was his last show, um, you know, and at the end he goes. That's it. I don't know if I'll be back again. And then it all went away from there. But uh, yeah, that's right. You know, he was um, he he uh, was what is that? Was entertaining. I'll say that. But speaking uh, of Roland and and news people, I mean Dean Pagani uh, was the news guy at POP and went to uh, went from there to become Roland's chief of staff. Yeah. But uh, before the shit hit the fan, Dean 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 jumped off of that. Uh, Jumped off of that ship because he uh, he could he could read the tea leaves and uh, and he uh, and he and he he got out when the getting was good. But uh, Dean Dean was a great was a great news guy. Oh yeah. yeah, and he was a he was a perfect straight man too. He still is. I mean, Dean had an incredible sense of humor, and he could just play straight all day long. But uh, he really did it. All right, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to, because uh, Dave is bothering me right now, and he sits there rocking his chair like he's oh, running. Dave. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, oh, Dave. How let's get this Dave. stuff done, buddy. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the recording, but guys, please stay if you can stay. I know some of you guys have got other obligations, and you may have to... Yep. To drop off. So let me um, let me first of all thank everybody uh, for for your opinions and hopefully we did. Um, I was trying to grab as many opinions as we could to kind of you know keep it open. I uh, um, Pete Salant reminded me that the reason that we put this whole program together in the first place was a bunch of friends could get together and and just hang out and talk. So that's what we try to do every week. So um, yeah, to get my twenty bucks back too. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oasis, don't give them the money. Don't give them the money. But uh, hey, I want to thank Brian Thomas and uh, I want to, of course, Joe Connolly, who was so supportive of putting this all together. Bob Craig and Russ Oasis, they got to get the twenty bucks over to him. And uh, I know we could go on and on about jingles in the news business with Tracy Carmen. So. 
Thank you. And, uh, and of course, John Landry is always so supportive. And even though he, 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 he chimes in from time to time, but he usually quietly, but he also sends me great ideas. So I appreciate that, John. And Pete Salant, Pete and I spent almost an hour on the phone yesterday so he could remind me what we're supposed to be doing here. I try, <laughs> I, I always look for all the input we could get. And uh, Barry, what a great surprise. And to have you here, and I would really, really, and I know we all would like to have you come back and take us through all the different stories of, you know, and uh, you, I always love the way, I mean, do you remember when Obama got elected? We won't go political, but talk about that inauguration in this. Yes, it was a mad party at uh, CRN, but we won't do that now because we don't do political. But um, Barry was uh, Barry Barry was also uh, very supportive of the staff, and we all we all miss that. And hopefully, we're going to get a good reunion together of, of CRN. Uh, mm-hmm. Bob Parks, Dave Overson, uh, Judge Harrigan, Lee Gordon, Tracy Woods, Clark Smith. Dave Nagel and uh, I know Dave, Dave and and, uh, and and Brian could do some great stories about news at HCN, I'm sure. But um, yeah, guys, thank you, uh, thank you so much. Did I miss anybody? I'm I'm going through my my gallery here, hopefully covering everybody. But uh, I uh, I gotta thank you here. So I'm let gonna me, let off. me tell you a quick. Let me tell you a quick yeah, one before ahead. we sign off. That's okay. Providence Journal Bulletin had a reporter who went to the Rhode Island Amateur Yo-Yo Championships. <laughs> And you can see this coming, right? So both um, senators at the time, Pastore and uh, the other old guy that I can't think of, were yeah, at this. Playborn Pell. Uh, yeah. Right. They were both at this event, and they competed with yo-yos, and they did, they did a big story on it. And somebody as a joke in the newsroom at the Journal Bulletin said, it was determined that they really couldn't compete because they were deemed to be professional yo-yos, not amateurs. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this thing like this thing hits the street that goes right by the proofreaders, and they had 50, 100 copies of this that were already in the system before they caught it, changed the, the lead in the story, and rewrote the story to make it accurate. So... <laughs> You never know who's listening and who's watching. Well, and I, I also, before we jump off, I would be amiss if I didn't mention, uh, please, uh, if you if you haven't heard about the Broadcasters Foundation of America, uh, please take a look at what they're all about. They support a lot of the men and the women that uh, have been in the industry and maybe falling on tough times financially or physically or emotionally or whatever. But um, please uh, check out what they're all about. And uh, T.J. Lambert turned us on to them. We've had them on with us before. So. Please support them uh, whenever you can. All right, let me just uh, jump on. You're you're pissing Dave (laughs) off. You're pissing Dave off. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Your friend, your friend has got a lot to share.